Good evening, everybody. Uh, this is Patrick Milliken from the Poison Pen Bookstore, and uh, I've been looking forward to tonight for an awfully long time. We're joined by my good friend, Willie Vlotten, amazing uh, musician, songwriter, novelist, and all around cool guy. Um, welcome, Willie. It's great to have you on this, on our little show here. Uh, thanks for having me, man. It's good to see your face. Yeah, it's been, we were just talking a little bit before we got started uh, about just what a wild ass, crazy, surreal year this has been, you know, especially for musicians. Yeah, I mean, it's been a really, I mean, luckily, you know, I, we don't tour that much, but, you know, I think we tour maybe three months a year at that. And uh, so we're pretty lucky, but Jesus, it's heartbreaking for all the for all the tour bands and even the, the guys that are playing like two, three nights a week it, in town places uh, to lose their, their money and they're living and being scared that way. Yeah, that's frightening for us. For us, it was kind of we just kind of got together and we made a record. But then we said, oh, let's just sit tight until uh, until this all blows over. So we're, we're not in any hurry to do anything. But and we're sitting on two records right now. So we yeah. feel. Like, yeah, fantastic. Yeah, for those of you who don't know, uh, Willie's band, current band, is called the DeLines. And uh, go out, steal, you know, buy, buy it used, get it wherever you can, but get a copy of uh, Colfax, uh, the first album that you guys made. It's just a beautiful album. Um, Thank you for saying that. Yeah, and I love the Imperial, too. You have two albums in the can? Well, we have an instrumental record we just finished that's kind of a soundtrack to uh um to to the and night always comes and then we we have our third record which is called the sea drift and um and that'll come out next year yeah i, I really the sea drifts we worked on for a year and a half like it's a we really toiled over it uh, and i think it's a cool one so hopefully people you know hopefully people like it you know we'll right. see well we'll get into talking about um about literature books noir weirdo music weirdo ambient music and whatever else might come up <laughs> guitars um but for everybody watching on facebook this is uh willie's brand new book and um we just got in at the poison pen our signed copies although we're just about sold out so i'm gonna have to hit you up willie to sign another batch for us uh, i've been nice. selling the hell out of it <laughs> that's, good. that's a nice thing to hear yeah but just uh just a brilliant book and um as always, you know, just a very moving book. And we'll get into that in just a second, and I'll pick your brain about where this particular book comes from. I know it has a somewhat unique story. But uh, let's start the conversation, um, as most good conversations do get started with Shane McGowan, because I see Pogue's poster behind you there. Um, have you seen, have you happened to seen the, the documentary that's out about him? No, you know, I haven't seen it yet. You know, I was, uh, you know, I grew up, my dad went to England and uh, bought, bought the top 20 record, no, top 10 records in England in like 1982 or three and gave them to me, which is probably the nicest thing he ever did. And, and it had the jam in it and it had the Pogues. And, and I love the Pogues because my whole idea of music was to disappear. Like I just wanted to not live where I lived and I just wanted to live in a different world. And and the Pogues, you did. You lived in this romantic, Shane McGowan, drunken Irish, wrote, you know, he's brilliant lyricist world. Yep. And so when this record, uh, uh, If I Should Follow the Grace of God came out, they they had this poster. Some, I forget where I was, but I've had it for 30 years, 35 years or something like that. And I, I always take it wherever I go. And it's one of the only possessions I haven't lost because, uh, uh, you know, I just like the band. They, they they meant a lot to me as a kid. Yeah, his writing, his writing is is just so, uh, as you say, it's just beautiful writing. In the in the documentary, which is I recommend seeing, it's uh, the state he's in is. I mean, it's amazing the guy's still alive for one thing. Yeah, but he talks about you know he talks about about his writing and he's he said, um, you know, I write songs about you know, fucking and fighting and living and dying you know and uh you know it occurs to me that that you do the same <laughs> on some level that's the important the important stuff right well you know the crazy thing i just it just made me think in the first reading i did 
ever really was in England and, and they, they booked it at, uh, and it was in London and it was at Shane McGowan's favorite bar where he hung out every night. And my wife, uh, but she was my girlfriend then, she was there with me and she, and I was like, man, I hope Shane McGowan's not here because he'll, he'll make fun of me. I know he'll make fun of me because I was playing a couple songs too. And I was really nervous. I, you know, I don't have a lot of confidence as it is. And, um, and I was petrified that he'd be there. And I, so I asked her, I go, can you just check to see if he's there? And she came back to me and she goes, man, he's in, the, he's in the bar. Jim McGowan's in the bar. He's going to, he, he came down, he's going to watch your reading and your, you play. Oh and, I about, and I about threw up, you know, I was like, I can't, uh, I can't handle that. And then, um, and I go, well, could you stand next to him? And if he says any mean things, can you just hit him? You know, can you just tell him to shut the fuck up? If he says <laughs> me because I don't think I could take it I don't think I could have but that you know at, at that time man he was one of my big heroes and and so um she stood next to him the whole time and he said something really nice and then that, while I was doing my thing and then after the show um he came up to me and um and he stole like he fake stole the book like he kind of picked it up and put it in his coat and gave off his little weird laugh he has and um and he kissed my hand and I swear to God, man, it was like the first time you kiss a girl or something. You're, my whole arm caught on fire. I didn't sleep that whole night. My whole arm, like it was just surreal. I just, I ended up walking around town that whole night saying, how the hell did I get to the place where Shane McGowan kissed my hand? So it was one of the, that it is was one of the nicest things. And, and back then he could walk, you know, and, and he had really soft hands and he was a good kisser too. Wow. That's, that's gotta be surreal. Oh, it was so fun, man. Once in a while you get lucky and that was just like a lucky night, you know, like if he was in a bad mood or something or, or I, I, maybe I would have read something he didn't like, it could have turned ugly, but, but he liked me that night and I'll take it. Was that the filthy McNasties? Yeah, I was. Okay. Cause I, I, I don't know if George was on the bill that night, but I know uh, our, our mutual friend, George Pelicanos, uh, who, by the way, was the first one to hit me to your work many years ago. He did a reading with them, the band. Exactly. Yeah, no, no, he wasn't there, man. It was just me. I don't think they did it for any other reason except they that the bar had readings. And I just got lucky that Shane McGowan was there and he was in a good mood. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Um, let's see here. Well, I mean, just, just to, to kind of amble our way towards the new book, uh, I wanted to ask you just a couple of basic questions for uh, for people who might not know your stuff. I know there are a few out there, but uh, where where did you grow up? I know you've ended up in in Oregon uh, for much of your adult life, but where did you grow up? I lived uh, pretty much uh, till I was twenty six in in Reno, um, ah. and, uh, and you know I I was just a failed musician. Uh, and a failed writer in, in Reno. And, you know, my mom was really conservative and she hated that I was in a band and, and, um, and hated, you know, that I wrote stories or whatever. And so, and it's hard to, it's, it's just hard to be a failure. And when your mom's, <laughs> when your mom's around you. So, uh, and I was scared of all the other big cities, you know, I, I, I kind of wanted to move to New Orleans, but I didn't have the guts. And I was scared of Los Angeles and San Francisco and Seattle. And I worked at this trucking company and they had an opening in, in Portland. And, uh, and so I moved up, uh, to Portland. Um, and there was a band in Portland, uh, named Cracker Bash and they played in, in Reno one night and they were a really great band. And they were, the, the lead singer was a super cool guy, a guy named Sean Krogan. And he, uh, he said, you know, Portland's really great. And they have ba all the houses have basements so you can practice for free. And if you rent a house and, uh, and so I, so I transferred up there and, and, it, and thank God I did. It was, a, it was a lucky move. And I met the guys in Rich and Fontaine and, and, uh, you know, got to be in a real band. So you were in your mid twenties, you say? Yeah, I was, I think I was 26, 27 when I got up here. So I wasn't young, man. I was, I was, a, I loved, you know, I loved Reno. Um, I, there's certain aspects of Reno I just loved, uh, but, and I didn't want to leave at all. Maybe that's why my first couple of books are set in Reno. Uh, because I really didn't want to leave Reno, but uh, but I knew to you know to to 
being uh, to be around weirdos and people that like the arts I, ha I had to leave to a different kind of town and and luckily i landed in portland which is so great to musicians and writers i mean it's, yeah. it, it was like heaven when i moved here right so then you've um your band richmond fontaine did did you start the band or was the band already existing yeah no no yeah i started it and uh, those guys were lucky uh or unlucky uh we were all lucky i guess to find each other but uh i'm always i always feel kind of guilty because I, I wrote so many songs that we ended up doing all, all all my tunes and you know i'm not the best singer uh but but we grinded it out for 20 some odd years and had a really nice time i mean they're just they're just uh the coolest guys uh in the world i think those guys are well and you grabbed a couple of them to to, to form the delines right yeah 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 so i guess in my 50 I guess I was, well, shit, no, man, I was probably like in my mid forties. You, you start seeing, you know, the end of the road, you, you start saying to yourself, uh, 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 if I, if I want to do something different in my life, I better do it now. Cause I'm running out of time. And I was always uncomfortable being the lead guy in a band. And, um, and I don't think I was that good at it. Uh, and so a good friend of mine, Amy Boone from the, uh, from a band called the damn nations, which she played in with her sister. Um, we toured together and hung out together and um and i really loved her voice and she did a tour with Richard fontaine in the band and so i wrote her all these songs um hoping that she we she and i'd start a new band and it would be kind of late night country soul music uh and i would hide in the back in a suit that you would a black suit so i'd disappear against the the black backdrop and 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 it works you know so uh she's so cool and the band's great uh i i love those guys and um i have so a bit of i have a bit of a crush on amy boone just yeah, via, she's just via her voice you know you've got the greatest singing voice and the greatest speaking voice i could you know she could like i want to do ads with her selling stuff because she's so great uh yeah it's really fun and and i you know even as a kid you know i was trying to be a punk rocker um or whatever uh like like we were saying before this like i wanted to be in a metal speed metal band or a speed me uh, speed punk kind of hardcore band but but really at home i just wrote ballads even at 12 13 years old i was writing like super long super super sad ballads so now i finally just accepted myself and now i get to just write ballads for this really cool woman to sing yeah well, this gets to, uh, to kind of where I wanted to go, which was, you know, you're one of the few, um, you know, successful uh, artists who who actually are, you know, do both, you know, and, and do both professionally anyway. I know a lot of writers um, who, you know, kind of tinker with music on the side and, and I'm not sure about the vice versa part. I'm sure there are some, but, um, do you when you're thinking about your mind do you, does the writing the songwriting and your fiction writing come from the same source do you think of it all as 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 a piece yeah you know i i've always thought um i've always thought of the subject i've always read about the same sort of subject i always wanted from a really early age i think maybe the only only gift i have like i have a nephew who's a shredding guitar player by the time he was 16 he was three times the guitar player I was. So I'm, I have no natural talent really, except I knew the stories I wanted to tell. And I think it from a, from a, you know, 12 or 13, I, I knew I wanted to t tell stories about like working class stories. Maybe, maybe I read too much Steinbeck or listened to too much of the jam uh, or the clash growing up, but I really did know that aspect. I didn't know what that part. And then, um, and and I think you know re realistically I probably would have just been a writer, but I was not great in school, and I don't think I had the confidence to think I had anything to say or I deserved to have anything to say. Um, and so you know anybody can get in a band, you know you just need like a friend and, and a place to play. And so I just I wrote songs uh, for years and years and years, and and then just wrote stories in se in secret because I was kind of embarrassed uh um because i wasn't a great student and um and i didn't want anybody to pick on me over it so i just kind of kept them to myself and it, it wasn't until really i read like raymond carver and 
uh, uh, Larry Brown that I that I said to myself, "Wow, you can write about just kind of failed men." And I said, yeah. and I was like, "Well, I, I know those I know those stories, and I don't have to do a lot of research for those stories. I don't have a lot. I don't have to have a lot of confidence to write those stories because I just know them." And then after I read those guys, kind of guys, uh, um, I started writing and like with more ambition, maybe around 18, 19, 20, I started really diving in. And by then I just kind of married the two, the, the, the music and, and the writing, but, but the, but the writing I kept to myself for another 15 years, maybe till I was 33, 34, 35, uh, you know, I'd written a handful of novels and stuff, but I didn't really show, show them to anybody um, just cause I was scared people wouldn't like them. And so the, your first published novel is Northline, right? It was a motel life. Was and, it a motel? Oh, excuse me, I, I got them reversed. And, motel life. And I just got lucky with that, that one. You know, my band was starting to do better in uh, the UK, uh, and we were touring over there. And um, and uh, I did an interview with a with a writer, a really cool crime writer named Stav Sherez, and he's he said, "I bet you write novels." And I said, "Well, you know, I do." And he introduced me to his agent, who is still my agent. And um and she sold she sold the motel life uh so I got really I got really lucky uh the, there that's super cool and um so uh kind of let's just skip forward to the, to the new book and then we'll kind of go back and forth a little bit when you when you say that you were you were raised in Reno a lot of it's starting to come into focus you know because uh, I I think of at least some of your books as as Western Western novels at least at their heart. You know, especially the last one. Don't skip out on me. Definitely. Uh, do you consider yourself uh, a Westerner or whatever that means? I mean, I grew up in love. I grew up in love with Nevada. Uh, you know, I was. I, I never lived with my dad, but uh, um, he was a big Nevada guy. And my mom's boyfriend, uh, the one I live with the most, um, uh, was obsessed with Nevada and driving around Nevada. Both those guys like driving around Nevada and camping and, and hunting and uh, uh, they were just big fans. And my mom was a big fan of like Basque culture. Oh, and, nice. okay. And so we, we did a lot of like Nevada trips that way. And so I always loved it. And then as I got older, I, there was a different side of it that I liked, which was uh, I started around 17 and 18 when when I guess I started realizing that I was I was kind of a dented guy that I didn't have much confidence that I was a little beat up already um I got really attracted to like the drifter side of Reno and the the more casino derelicts I guess you know the guys in the old man bars of Reno which were different than anywhere else there was a lot of just kind of failed men in Reno and I, it really struck something in me, I think, as, as a kid. Um, I think I was both really frightened that I was going to be one of those guys and also kind of excited that I was going to give up and get to be one of those guys and just accept the fact that I was a bum. Kind of that battle's kind of probably the whole, my whole, everything I write about is that kind of battle, I think. And, and, um, and so, yeah, I loved Reno uh, for that. I mean, I just loved it to death. I kind of fell in, in my early 20s. I think I fell in love with it you like you would, like a, you know, a, a girl or whatever. I just, you know, I really dug it. And, and now I've spent my whole life trying not to be one of those guys that you'd walk across in Reno who was 50 and hanging by a thread. Uh, but, but it always attracted me. So, yeah, man, I always wanted to write about the West just because – I wanted to write about things I lo loved, and 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 Nevada is one of them. Yeah, it's funny. Um, when I think of the West, there's part of me that that thinks of the Pacific Northwest too, particularly with someone like Carver, you know, because he he straddled that line really really well and wrote about the West. Um, have you have you just by chance have you read Todd Goldberg's new collection of short stories called no. The Low Desert? I'll check it out. I'm it's killer. Yeah, I mean, he, he's written this amazing collection of pieces that's all around, you know, uh, the Salton Sea and, that, you know, that area from Imperial Valley up through Palmdale, just that all those weird little outposts and, you know, the Indian casinos and uh, you, you'd love it. I mean, it's, it's really, really good stuff. Um, yeah, let's talk a little bit about The Night Always Comes. Uh, you know, this, 
in some ways, uh, would you say this is unique in, in what you've done so far? And that at least I identify a definite noir undertone here amidst everything else that's going on. There's a lot going on in this book. Yeah, I mean, no, I, I, I keep thinking about The, the, the Night of Us Comes as, as, a, as a book of panic um, and, and desperation. And I think noir is always based in desperate people making desperate decisions. And I think Lynette, the main character in The Night Always Comes is desperate. And I always think about it, you know, it's like when people are, when you're, I, I kind of say the same thing, but I, but it, I think it's true. It's it's like a, if you're walking down the street and all of a sudden everybody's passing you, like in cars, and you're like, how do they get cars, man? I'm still walking. And it, you feel like, I better hurry up or I'm going to miss out. It's like a gold rush, say. And I think what you find is Lynette's kind of seeing that happen to her in her life. She's seeing gentrification and coming at such a rapid pace and she's seeing her city change so rapidly that she starts to panic. Um, and you, and when you meet her, she's in full desperation mode uh, within the first 30 pages. And and that's a very noir feel to it. And I, and I wanted it to have that kind of feel. So yeah, I, you know, I've always been a huge fan of, of classic noir novels and those uh you know they've been a huge thing for me and 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 i've always wanted to to, to write in that vein without the crime part yeah um, this was the first one i did that that had the urgency and the kind of the 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 just blatant desperation that that uh noir has now there's a special there's a note in the book uh about you know about portland and how it was there was this little derelict house um, and it was so important for you to to buy that damn thing and fix it up and uh, it was almost like a rite of passage into adulthood in some ways maybe I don't know um, can you talk about that house and is it still standing oh yeah man I still own it <laughs> yeah you still own it <laughs> oh yeah man it was the first good thing I ever I ever did on my own I mean I think I just maybe things have changed and maybe I'm just getting old uh, but you know, I was raised to believe that if you had, uh, um, if you owned a house, you weren't a loser in life. You had succeeded. Like my mom would always say, "Well, the guy owns a house at least, you know, um, like he's made something of himself." Because really, if you look at it in the history of mankind of, of in post-industrialization, having a having your own piece of property or your own house means you have power. Right. You have uh, savings, you have equity, you have a, you can, you, you just, you, your little, your feet are planted a little firmer um, in, in the world. And so I grew up thinking that, and, you know, and I, and again, man, I always struggled with, with uh, confidence or, uh, uh, you know, I always imagined myself as a bum. Um, and so when, when I had an opportunity to buy this house, you know, it was 480 square feet and the, none of the plumbing worked and um it was just it was like a this guy that lived next door it was his mother-in-law's little house they built her and he was selling it and uh it was next to a, a mini mart and um and and i bought it and uh and it, it did it did make me feel a lot better about myself because i was i said to myself well at least i, I own something i'm not a complete bum and it kind of shifted it shifted something in me and i you know i this is pre-cell phone i quit uh answer my, I'd, un, I'd, I'd disconnect my phone at 10 so I wouldn't go out. I made myself, you know, cause I was like, well, I own a house now, kind of like tortilla flat yeah. but I, where uh, uh, I own a house now. So I gotta be kind of, I have to have my shit semi together. <laughs> it was really fun. And one of the, the, the greatest things that, that, that I did on my own, I guess. Wow. And so what's, what's going on with it now? Is it somebody, somebody yeah, living but, in it or? Is it, Buddy of mine writes it. I just hang on to it because it was the first good thing I, I ever did, and I just want to hang on to it to remind myself that I did something good. So is it housing your vinyl collection or <laughs> no man, it's my buddy and his girlfriend. It's housing them. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. yeah. Now, um, just to kind of catch up, um, so in the new book, uh Lynette, when we meet her, I mean the with this book and especially with the free, um you get that exhaustion is just palpable, you know? I mean, she's working 
two, two official jobs and a couple of unofficial jobs, or at least one, um, you know, and, uh, you know, she's taking care of her uh, developmentally disabled brother. Was that something, by the way, that, that came to you right away, the brother? I was wanting to talk about the like uh, the burdens that families have, and and I hate saying that that brother's a burden, but he but he's a lot of work, um, and and every family has weight they're carrying, I think, and every family has their uh, their kind of scars or their damaged uh, damages that they're trying to keep together enough to keep going, and so I wanted to say, hey, here here's a a really struggling working class family who have been just kind of limping by their whole journey together. And now you're throwing in this massive gentrification and massive increase in housing prices and rental prices. Your whole city's changing, but you haven't changed. You're still, you're still making the same sort of money um, and it, you're still struggling. And now you have to adapt to, the, to this new city which is happening all over the West. Um, and so I wanted, uh, you know, I wanted a, a, the brother in there for that reason and for a reason to talk about uh, Lynette's, you know, she's basically raised as a kind of a servant to her brother and a servant to her mother. And, and it's really scarred her up. And it's really been difficult for her as an adult, I think, because she was really always raised to, uh, to work for her brother and take care of her brother and wasn't given the right amount of love and so she's trying to navigate a rough childhood which so many people have yet and still try to do the best she can with how she feels she can do it it's meaning she doesn't really think outside the box you know she's just like well i, I don't have a lot of opportunities so i'm gonna just get another job and i'll work twice as much I'm still not going to make that much at either of them, but I don't know how I don't know how people make a lot of money. I don't know anything about IT world. It's it's like her mother says later on, like where does somebody get five thousand dollars to buy a couch or three hundred dollars to buy a pair of shoes? Like how do they figure this shit out? And I think both Lynette and her mom don't understand how to get there, so they just Lynette in particular just grinds out with the only things she knows. And the relationship, uh, I don't want to give any spoilers, but they're, I'm not, I'm not. Um, the, the relationship between Lynette and her mother, I thought was just so beautifully done. Um, did that take a lot of, a lot of chopping and chopping down and reshaping and uh, to get that right? Yeah, I mean, I took, I took a lot of risks on it because I, I think in family, sometimes there's a, uh, uh, that, that, that arguments or relationships of any kind that you've known somebody for, for a lot of years, uh, the, the arguments should really always be like business discussions, but they're not. They become like one person, like picking on the next person oftentimes. I'm always interested in like those little daggers people throw at each other that know each other really well. They really hurt and, and they don't stop. They just, it's like, a, I think of her mom, um, and, 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 and Lynette together is like a, the mom is breaking up with her daughter. Yeah. At the very beginning of the book, she's trying to like break up with her daughter. And, and so she's trying to keep her daughter like a boxing match. She's trying to keep her daughter off balance the whole time so her daughter can't fight back. And so I was interested in that. And I, I made it, I wanted to write a novel where by page 25, you're in this serious argument in this serious, like really twisty, turny relationship. Um, because I, I, you know, I like those kind of things in novels where it just kind of comes out of left field. And, and I wanted to see if I could pull off like a big, big series of arguments uh, bet between a mother and a daughter that are breaking up, really. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because, you know, you, you feed us a little bit of Lynette's backstory and, um, you know, this heartbreak that she's got, you know, been through. Um, and, uh, you know, there's mental, uh, mental illness, which was really sensitively handled, I thought, and addiction and, um, you know, all the things that we, uh, that, uh, maybe the cruel inequities of modern life have created, you know, in some ways, uh, any comments on, on that kind of thing? 
I mean, I, I think with Lynette, I, I'm always interested in, in powerlessness. I yeah. think, and um, and and I think with Lynette, there's there's you know some people explode and some people implode when when they feel powerless. Some people like throw tantrums or or, or get really angry because it you know you get angry at somebody, it, it pushes them back, it kind of recalibrates everything. And if you implode, it's just you're just taking it out on yourself. And I think I think Lynette, when she feels like she has no choices left, she explodes, and and it's really been difficult for. Her. Um, you know, I think with with her is she just never she was always taking care of her brother, and she was never really got to be a kid, and so she doesn't know how she doesn't know how to love. Uh, and so if you meet her at 30 years old and here's this person that doesn't really know how to love, doesn't really like herself at all. Um, and, but it's been trying, been, you know, going into debt to try to fix herself with therapy and, and, and she's had some real crash and burn moments. Um, but I, but I think, you know, I, I was really interested in, in, in the survival aspect of that, you know, like she's still really cool and she's just trying to get through and, uh, and she's pulling out the other side, but that being said, you know, when you've been that rough, have had that rough up and down and emotionally, like mentally ill, man, there's a cost to be, it's paid. I mean, it's hard to be around uh, mentally ill people. It, it, I mean, it's tiring and scary and the rules change and you don't know if they're changing, but you're like, oh shit, the rules just changed. And it's so it's, you know, so I see the mother side too and it, it's, right. it's, it's rough. Uh, but yeah, I was interested. I, I was interested in all that. I always have been. Yeah, and so, I mean, I mean, the basic setup is is that Lynette has this dream. She's up. They're offered this old house uh, at a what seems to be a decent price. You know, the landlord's getting ready to get out of it, and uh, and so that's that becomes the focus of her dream. And she saved up all this money, and it's contingent upon mom throwing in her share, and at the this isn't a spoiler because it's right at the beginning of the book, basically. Uh, mom backs out at the last minute. And that, uh, the book takes place over just a couple of days, right? I mean, two or three days, something like that. Yeah, two days. Um, yeah, and so then it's, you're spinned into this hyper desperation mode. And that's when the whole noir sucking down thing kind of starts. But, um, and so I won't, I won't say much more than that about it. Um, but it really is a remarkable book. Um, you know, I've read it twice now and I keep finding new, new things in it. Um, uh, boy, um, there was something else kind of related to that that I wanted to ask you. Uh, well, the mom buys a Toyota, didn't she buy a brand new Toyota Camry instead? She bought an Avalon, which is an upgrade of that. Oh, an Avalon. You know, I think some people, I think there's that idea like where you're so tired all the time. I mean, we could talk about that with guitars or whatever. It's like sometimes if you feel like nothing's going right in your life, you're never going to own a house. You're never going to get out of the making the kind of money you make. Uh, you're never going to be like vacationing in Hawaii. So, you know, why not buy a new guitar? Because it like, you know, you mess about it or why not? Like the mom says, you know, every day I go to work, they, everybody passes me in my shitty little Saturn and they know I'm a loser. And yeah. She goes, I just don't want people to think I'm a loser for once in my life. And so her mom, mom's shooting herself in the foot by getting in debt, buying this car that she shouldn't buy. And Lynette's trying to tell her it means nothing. But to the mom, it's like, you know, I want to at least act like I'm somebody. And, and, and it probably will make the mom feel better for a month or two. Right. Maybe or maybe six months, but then the, all those old bad feelings and the, those feelings of like, God, I don't have enough hours at this job. Uh, how, what am I going to do for money? Uh, I'm always going to be a loser. They come back. And, and I think Lynette, even by age 30, knows that. She's like, look, mom, you know, this is just this is not going to change anything. You're just destroying your future because you're giving up. And so that was kind of the idea of the mom's kind of given up. She's saying there's no way we can make it through this gentrification boom. So why even try? So don't act like you're good enough to buy this house. And, and also the house is, you know, next to a freeway and it's, 
it's a tear down house and um and it's you know basically three hundred thousand dollars and they're getting a deal on it the funny thing is is when i wrote it started writing this book i think it was four years ago and i did i did three i did two hundred eighty thousand three hundred thousand dollars say and and now that same house would be maybe four hundred thousand so it's gone up in just four years it's gone up a hundred thousand dollars which is just fucking insane you know, it's fun because the house I'm talking about is worse than the house that I bought for seventy thousand dollars twenty years ago. Uh, I mean, it's you know, you know, it's one of those houses that you know would be torn down. Right. It's funny. Phoenix is uh, is just going crazy right now, and uh, my wife and I were lucky enough. Just dumb luck. We bought in uh, two thousand and nine. Um, you know, this cool old 1920s house downtown. And at that time, you know, copper was really high valued at that. So people, the tweakers were stealing copper and our house had all the copper stripped out of it, the house we wanted to buy. And it, it was a bank owned property. And we went in there and um, got it for a song. And now it's like two and a half times what we paid for it. And it's like, phew. You know, I mean, but, just, like if you, it just makes you feel more secure in your life. You're like, hey, I did something good, and you just <laughs> like in, in life in general, man. Like if you get a couple lucky breaks, then then you kind of keep going, and then if you get if you get hit in the legs too many times, you just you kind of start you stop trying. And I think a lot of the issues of the book is to try or not to try, where Lynette feels like she still feels like she can get that old school American dream and she can have security for her brother and her mom and her mom's like d disillusion. Her mom's like been beat up in life and her mom's had some bad breaks and her mom just can't try anymore. And I, and I was really interested in that idea. Like if her mom could just, uh, just like take a pause and say, look, I, you know, this is a good investment for all of us. But, but again, her mom's tired of living with Lynette and, and, yeah. and, and would rather you know go down in flames than than live in that same place so it's heartbreaking in that regard yeah and she's mom seen her own opportunities kind of dwim, dwindle away throughout the years yeah. yeah man yeah so just let's just buy guitars i mean <laughs> yeah well like the guy in my band uh, richmond fontaine uh, his name's dan Eccles. he's one of my best friends and uh really really cool dude he just said, "Well, you don't need to buy another guitar. You just need to be better at the guitar you you do own." Oh. And I'm oh, like, man. Man, I "Hear that? You know, can I just buy another guitar?" And he's like, "Nah, you just got to be a better guitar player." <laughs> uh, uh, where's yeah. the fun? Where's the fun in that? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, you've got a point, man. I I think about that daily about most things. You know, you just got I just got to work harder, and you know, you can't buy your way out of shit. You know. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's 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 uh. It's interesting to say, you know, that you, you know, you've suffered from your own kind of self-doubt over the years. You know, you've brought that up several times and it's like, what, what kind of advice would, do you have for, um, you know, aspiring writers who might be watching, who, who feel like they don't, you know, they don't have approval to do it, you know? The thing about writing is you can fail in private. I mean, it's a very lonely, like, it's really fun to, if you can publish them because, I mean, it's scary to put them out in the world and some people aren't going to like them and beat them up and all that. But, but you get, you, you have a mission and you, you have a little bit more confidence. Um, the reason I didn't send books out for whatever, 17 years is because I was scared. They would say I sucked. And, and, and then you're like, well, what's, <laughs> there's no, if you know you're bad at something, you're probably not going to get up early before work and, and write on a story. So I don't have a lot of, uh, you know, my, my thing is like a, the act of disappearing into a story was so much fun. Like living in Reno and writing about Reno was so fun. I felt it was like some of the best times, even some of, even though my stories were often difficult, it was, it was my favorite thing to do. So my take to, to writers is if you can disappear into a world that you read, that makes your life better or is a great escape, then don't worry about the rest of it. Uh, Cause that in itself, it's, I mean, it's a lot cheaper than buying a car to make yourself feel better. And, uh, and you can, 
you can get it on with anyone you can kill anyone you can drink as much as you want or eat as much as you want and you can live in hawaii if you want or in turkey or greece you can do anything you want and it's free you just you just get it and you're not unlike being in a shitty band where everybody's pissed at you all the time your neighbors are mad your whoever you're living with is mad uh uh writing you're just quiet in a corner and and, and you get to disappear and be and be in a world that that feels right to you so uh so that for me was always the the the, the big battle for me with publishing was you know if 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 I get published and it's and people really beat up on it, well, you know, will I still want to, uh, will I still want to go hide out in the world that I created? And, uh, so the, it's all about the work really, and not about anything else. Now, I know that, uh, you know, before you've been able to, to kind of concentrate on your writing and music full time, uh, I know it's been a long time now, but you worked some shitty ass jobs, didn't you? I mean, I just worked manual labor jobs. You know, I never was a um, your house painter. I was a house. I worked for trucking companies mostly uh, before house painting. I just worked for like T and T Best, well, just like trucking companies loading trucks. I worked for a chemical company loading uh, chemicals, and um and and then I was a, my best job was a house painter. I just worked in warehouses and 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 house painting was my best job by far because uh, I made the most money and. Eventually, I got to start my own business and, and went out on my own. And then, then I could then I could write, you know, in the morning and show up at ten o'clock and not get fired. You know, my whole life was trying to find time to, uh, uh, you know, to where I could make enough money but still have time enough to write. But but I just worked those kind of jobs because I was back then I was so shy I couldn't talk to people, and so I couldn't work in restaurants. I couldn't work in anything where there was like a retail or public things because I just could, I couldn't talk to people. So I just worked in warehouses and, 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 and loaded trucks, which you don't really have to talk, which, you know, kind of saved my ass and kept me down. It, it kind of beat me up uh, and uh, saved me at the same time. You know? I don't think I've asked you this. Um, you, uh, you know, you wrote a, a wonderful short story for that anthology a couple of years ago that I was lucky enough to be involved with the highway kind. And you introduced me to Patterson Hood, who wrote a killer story. Um, right. But in your in your story, which is about uh, about a guy who's a house painter, there's a a guy who works with him, um, who is constantly kind of not showing up and sort of self destructing. Um, you, is he based on a real person? <laughs> No man, he, he's kind of a. He was a jab. I used to hire this, but uh, this old friend of mine, and uh, to paint with me. You know, I used to hire guys just so I would show up. Like, I didn't really care about how much work they did. I just hired him to make sure I would show up. Because you know, if you hired a guy, you got to be there at eight o'clock. And you know, if it was a like scraping a house or doing something I didn't want to do, I would hire. I had a list of guys I would hire just so I would show up and work. And if they if they put in three or four hours of an eight hour day, I'd be ah, all right. But I had this old school friend of mine, they would always, like when he knew he was working for me, he would party all night the night before and then he'd show up so hungover he couldn't do anything. So a lot of time he'd be on like the drop cloth, you know, laying in like the fetal position or just saying, or, or spending all day apologizing that he couldn't work. So it was kind of that guy. But you know, in house pain, you always you run into a lot of guys that are kind of uh, either on the way up or on the way down as far as booze and and um, so I threw that in there. The funny thing about that story, Kill Switch, is I just wrote a novel based on it with those characters in it. Uh, no. During COVID, I wanted to write something that felt safe and and something that uh. I could have a lot of fun with and and so I just wrote a novel based based on the, those characters called oh. Rust. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's exciting. Yeah, yeah, it's really fun. I mean, I don't know if anyone will like it, but but uh there's a lot of derelict uh house painters in it. Cool. And there's is the Le Mans figure into it? Not any, not a little bit, but not much. Not much, but a little bit. It's 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 in there. Uh, right. Thank you for that opportunity. It's a really cool book, and I was really excited to get to be a part of it. So. Oh yeah, I was I was super stoked. You know, I'd love to see Patterson. Um, I was considering maybe I should have. I was considering reaching out to him 
and seeing if he would, as a surprise to you, show up partway through this. But um, have you been in touch with him recently? And is he writing? We, I think he's working on, uh, he's always working on like kind of a memoir thing or a, a history of his songs, I think, if I remember correctly. I could be screwing that up. Um, but I don't know. I mean, the guy's one of the hardest working songwriters I've ever met. And one of the, I mean, he was probably one of the cooler guys I've ever met, really, uh, in my life. Um, I haven't seen him that much this year at all. Maybe mm -hmm. once, or only twice, but but uh, um, but he's one of my biggest inspirations. I think that guy's just so damn smart and cool, and he's got such a, a open mind about things. And uh, as I get older, I start getting really, I'm starting to get more cynical. And so just learning from him and, and thinking about how he thinks about things makes, makes, uh, makes life easier. Do you find yourself as I do in some ways, you know, seeing myself have elements of that get off my lawn kind of personality kind of, kind of creeping in. I, I try to keep it at bay, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess I grew up with a like really right wing, in a really right-wing household, like really claustrophobically angry, like really angry and um, increasingly angry. And um, and I, that's my biggest fear, I think, yeah. is to be, to be like that. So I try really, really hard not to be like that. Yeah. But you can see how people get like that. I, I just am praying to God I don't, you know. I know. Yeah. yeah. I don't want to, you know, you want I think it's okay to be a little bit get off my lawn, but but you can do a TV all day and just yelling at it. Uh, yeah, yeah. You grew up, and and I, and I don't I don't want to be be that guy. No, definitely not. Well, um, I'm just kind of watching it. Some of the people who are writing in, and uh, our our good friend Craig Johnson, great writer. He He's, has yeah. Great. Yeah. I've read all those books and, you know, I listened to uh, George Goodall read them. Goodall, I think it is. Uh, and when I can't sleep, I listen to him. And that guy, man, he's so good at, at reading Craig's stuff. And uh, and so it's really fun to read a book and then to listen to it and, and to have a master like that guy read them. It's just brilliant. Yeah, Craig's such a great guy. And he's been so supportive of your work, too. I, uh, just the terrific. Really nice to me. Good dude. Um, let's see, let's see, not too many specific questions. Most people are just saying how much they love your book. A couple of people are, or love your books. A couple of people are weighing in that have already read the book, the new book and liked it. Um, Barbara has a question. She says, your characters are complex people. Uh, do they stick with you after the book is finished? Yeah, I think, I think the one that, um, a few of them do, you know, for different reasons. Um, but the one that, that kills me is uh, Horace Hopper from Don't Skip Out of Me, the, my last book. Um, uh, just saying that dude's, that kid's name breaks my heart. He was probably one of my favorite things, the favorite book I've, I've done because I like that kid so much. I relate to that, that kind of guy so much. Um, that still, just still saying that name or seeing the name Horace, which I named after Horace McCoy because he wrote... Oh. Uh, you shoot horses, don't they? Yeah. And uh, so that, and you know, and there are times because I've been talking about Lynette so much lately um, that I really worry about it. Like you start worrying about them, like I'm really worried about her by the end of the book. Like what's going to happen after the end of the book? Is she going to be okay? And is she yeah. tough to make it in life? And uh, so, so yeah, I, I do. They they do stay with me. Uh, the, I always think of them as kind of saints. They keep like a dented guy like me afloat. Yeah, I mean, to go to sleep at night and knowing you have Horace Hopper and Lynette in your head uh, and f the Flanagan brothers and Allison Johnson and Charlie Thompson from Lean on Pete, just knowing that they're kind of your pals and they, they're beat up too, but, they, but they're okay. Uh, it sounds silly, but it makes, it makes me get through, you know. It, 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 didn't, you, didn't you say that, uh, that Horace Hopper, AKA, Hector Hidalgo was kind of a, an homage to uh, David Hidalgo. Yeah, well, you know, or the name was, anyway. We had a black velvet painting in, in the rehearsal space at, uh, in the basement where Richard Fontaine practiced for Jesus, uh, maybe 10 years of our 20 years. We re rehearsed in this, our bass player's basement. 
and we had this guy we called Hector Hidalgo because we all love Los Lobos so much. And he was like a Mexican bandito. It was super tough. And it, it was mine. I bought it. So when we switched rehearsal spaces, I took him home and I, I had him on my wall. And he, I, he just looks at me every day and he says, like, don't be a wimp, you know, because he's super tough. So I, I'm a, I always put like beautiful women across from him so he can see beautiful women like like Myrna Loy or someone like that. So he can so he can look at him. And then uh, and, and he always tells me, like, to be, you know, shape up, man, be a man for once. Stop, stop crying in, in your boots, buddy. And um, but yeah, his last name was for uh, David Hidalgo, who's one of my favorite singers and songwriters. And uh, I mean, man, that guy can play guitar and accordion and yeah. he really is a national treasure i think actually all those guys are one of the coolest bands really one of the coolest bands i think uh and uh and i've always been you know since i was i remember where i bought uh um uh their first their second record um uh, how will the wolf survive i was you know like a junior in high school uh, i remember running around the pe uh, running around in a gym to P in PE singing, uh, last night I got loaded on a bottle of gin, that old Sultan. Uh, so they were brilliant at mixing, uh, like American Americana, uh, old blues, uh, soul, uh, like traditional Mexican music. They could like interweave it. it, it they're great, man. They're just the coolest. Kind of a, you know, Sun Records era rock and roll. They, yeah, they can do that as well. I mean, they can do anything and they can play like the Grateful Dead and they can do, you know, yeah. almond kind of stuff. I mean, they're, uh, those guys are just old school, real musicians. Yeah, I, I love the one that they did. Um, uh, uh, let's see, La Pistola y el Corazón. You know, the yeah. one that's all in Spanish. I love that album. That's a brilliant album, man. Just yeah. brilliant. Yeah. We saw them a couple of years ago, my wife Sandra and I, at, uh, they played out here in Chandler. And they they accompanied a Mexican uh, folklorico dance troupe. It was the coolest thing, you know. And they were they were providing the musical accompaniment, and so they had this folklorico dance troupe. It was really cool. Yeah, I've I mean, seen, you know, and and then David Hidalgo has been, you know, years ago did stuff with Mark Rabo. They toured yep. together, the like two guitar wizards, and uh, yeah, man, I could go on and on about them. They're just the coolest, just the coolest. Right. Well, who were some of your, um, you mentioned the Carver and Steinbeck and, and some of those uh, influences. Who are some of your main uh, musical influences? I mean, I think grow, growing up, I, I liked it. You know, like anybody, I love, I love it all. Um, uh, I think like, you know, at an early age, I was pretty open to, to all different kinds of music. Um, and, and I, you know, I was kind of, raised to to think that anything could be good and and it's not your job to be mean to what you don't understand it's your job to figure out uh what's going on in that so i thought you know like i was you know as a little kid i would love to like i i loved like springsteen and yes and rush and then i think as i got more like as you start growing up and you realize you're kind of like well i just struggled a lot let's just say that as a kid uh then then bands like like the replacements and who's could do and and those kind of like depressive like kind of like depressive working class rock i guess you call that in a way but you know kind of punk uh that really moved me and really kind of ruined me um you know i think I the remember, replace, I remember the last time you were out here you said was, yeah the, i remember the last time you out you were out here we had to talk about the replacements you're like, yeah, man, the replacements let me down. <laughs> well, the replacements were a day are a dangerous band for a, a I mean, I really like I really like they're a dangerous band for like a, like a for a, a burgeoning alcoholic kid who hates himself and yeah. it's not going right. Um, but yeah, that story I told you was just the replacements opening for Tom Petty and yeah. I worked at a car wash and I'd say I'd worked 13 days straight to save money for it. Cause I was dating this gal and I was going to take her on this big night out. And, uh, and that was when the replacements were just horrible. And she was, she was a true punk rocker. And so she was like, we were kids, you know, I was like 20 with a fake ID kind of guy. And, uh, and I was like, they're the greatest band. And, and she goes, they're, they're just making fun of you. You work 13 days straight to take me out tonight. 
and they're 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 so drunk and they're making and then they made fun of Tom Petty. And even though she was a serious punk rocker, she loved Petty. And um uh and she goes, You can't like a band that makes fun of Tom Petty. And then I went down to get their shirts because it was the first time I knew they were gonna have a replacement shirts. And uh and they were like 14 bucks back then, which is like fuck, it's like 50 bucks now. And it was and it just was dollar bills, like ten dollar bill for Paul Westerberg and so forth. And I I couldn't buy it, man. I just couldn't do it. And I went back to her and I said, Man, I don't understand. Why would they put dollar bills on it? It's not that cool a shirt. And she said, Ah, oh, they're just making fun of you for spending that kind of money on a shirt. And after that, I was and then, you know, they get off stage or whatever, and then Tom Petty comes on and the whole night's brilliant and uh uh you're happy and in love again and all that shit so but i love the replacements i like them and and i think around 17 i fell in love with uh well i guess it was before that i guess i was like 14 i bought uh swordfish trombones by tom waits and it scared me so bad i had to sell it back to the store because i didn't want it in my house uh because it scared me but i loved jonesburg illinois the ballad so much that I had to go back to that same fucking dude at the record store and buy the record back because I had to yeah. one song. And the beauty of back then with records is you listen to one song and then I had uh, a soldier sing on the other side of the record uh, and uh, that I liked the two ballads. And then before you know, you like three songs or four songs. And I think Tom Waits became probably my one of my biggest influences after that, after, after Swordfish Trombones, because I got to go back. Yeah. And get his earlier catalog. So, you know, I like all kinds of stuff, but but as a kid, Tom Waits really, really rocked, rocked my world, I guess, and shifted my ideas of what what you could write songs like as a as a guy and in, in, in a rock and roll way, because because he writes ballads, man, he writes classic ballads. It's funny because, uh, you know, I love Tom Waits for a long time and, um, you know, for, for the longest time, I was not ready for his real avant-garde stuff. You know what I mean? I loved Closing Time. I loved The Heart of Saturday Night. You know, I loved those, all those wonderful early albums. Um, but now, for some reason, some switch has turned in my brain. And I love all the crazy shit that he's done, too, you know? Yeah, it just depends. It's just avant-garde is just harder. you got to be in the right frame of mind. It's yeah. like really hard hard bop kind of jazz like you just gotta right. be in the right mind uh or you'll stick your head through a window and sometimes with some weird tom waits weirder stuff you if you're not, not in the right mood it, it can drive you nuts uh but it's cool to have it and it just shows you that he's just following he's just going down his own weird hole and yeah. find all these little branches to go off into and and it's exciting and and you know uh you know I, if i could be so brave you know Hmm. Like that, um, just let's see here we'll wrap it up here in just a second um yeah let's see uh nicholas uh asks he says when writing first drafts do you stick very close to a to a beat sheet or do you just disappear into it i don't know what a beat sheet is but uh yeah. but what i could do is like uh i could tell you over a cup of coffee what the story is about um you know, uh, I could write a poem about about the novel. Like I could tell you the overall arc of what Lynette and the Night Always Comes um, is. I don't know a lot of the stuff in the middle, but I kind of know the beginning and the end. And 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 then I just kind of go for it off that. And then the thing I like about writing is the first draft just means you get all you get the rest of your life to fix it. So I always think about it like you just bought you just bought a bad car that doesn't start, and now you have to figure out. And you're not a very good mechanic, and then but you but no one's there's no one's pressing time on you, and and you have all the money in the world to fix it, but you got to fix it yourself. Um, and so then I just tinker on it, and tinker on it, and tinker on it. But you, but generally, like the the soul of the book, I'll know when I start it. Gotcha. The soul will start landing. Uh, let's see. Okay, um, Barbara. Barbara asks. She says, "Were you were you a big reader as a child? And uh, what is a favorite childhood book that you really 
go, you know, was really important to you? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, uh, my my grandmother was an English teacher, and 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 like a, you know, probably my favorite relative, I guess you'd say, or besides my brother and my aunt, probably my favorite people, you know, growing up. Um, and uh, and so she always gave me books. So yeah, I read a lot, but I just read like James Bond. You know, as a, as a kid, uh, my favorite book was uh, My Side of the Mountain, about a kid that runs away and lives in a tree with a falcon. And uh, and I always wanted to be that kid, but I never had guts uh, to do to to leave. Uh, but I read just like uh, you know whatever my mom had, which were just like crime books or James Bond books or uh, John D. McDonald. Uh, I read a lot of that stuff, and then my grandfather gave me a Count of Monte Cristo, and I think that's what really kind of rocked me and, uh, and kind of changed my life. And that and 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 in school. It, it, from middle school till I graduated from high school, I'd read most of Steinbeck's uh, novels in school. He was just really popular in, in, in my high school. And um, and so I read him and I really bought into that, the whole workers' rights. And 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 my mom was a single mom and, uh, and really worked hard and got sexually harassed and passed over for jobs. And and she'd come home and tell us all about it every night. And so I really wanted to, you know, that was really important to me to write those kind of stories. So maybe Steinbeck. So yeah, I always, I like novels and movies and, and, and records as a kid. I, you know, I've, I've not changed at all much since I was a kid that way. Uh, Nancy says, how can anyone not like Petty? And she's right. You know, he's pretty universally liked, Tom Petty. Mm -hmm classic songwriter and i he's the guy that you spend 13 days working at a car wash i was li living in austin texas at the time and i didn't even know what humidity was and i moved to austin in the summer like a like that just shows you how bright i am and uh and i worked 13 days straight to see him and, and it was worth it you know like petty's just worth it he's a classic songwriter and his band always put on a good show and he's the guy that that uh you waste you know waste your life to afford to uh buy tickets to see him and then you're happy you did so yeah i can't say enough good things about petty it's funny how your experience mirrors mine exactly when it comes to i didn't i wasn't trying to impress a date but he the same tour came through phoenix and they played at the university uh activity center the replacements opening for petty and it was a friggin' disaster man um yeah it's they, they must have just the whole tour must have been a train wreck yeah, I mean, I think that's, I thought they were cool for that when, when you're you now playing punk rock clubs, but it's, but it's a di different deal when, when you're, when you're having to fork out big money to see a band yeah. um, and, and they're like, they're, they're your big purchase for maybe three months. And so I think at that point you kind of have to show up, uh, you know, I mean, I remember, yeah, yeah, that's all I'll say on that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll wrap it up here. Um, I, I threw on. That being said, I threw on Hoot Nanny. I had yeah, that. I've great. had that album. I've had that album since I was a teenager, and I hadn't listened to it in several decades. And I threw it on, and I was amazed at how good it sounded. You know, because a lot of the real hardcore punk stuff doesn't age particularly well. That stuff sure did. I mean, I think "Let It Let It Be" by the Replacements is one of the great records. Oh yeah. I mean, it's. I mean, it's just remarkable. And, and he's a brilliant songwriter, so uh, you know I love the band to death. I mean they're great. Uh, they're they're just a bad band to, to to take your girl to and blow whatever I blew that night 150 200 bucks on, you know. Yeah. Well, what are you listening to uh, these days? I know you're you're a very eclectic listener. Well, right now I'm just uh, uh, I'm in my because because we just did a soundtrack for uh, the new book. I I was in my like a. Uh, uh, wing victory for the Solon, that kind of ambient stuff. Uh, you know, I guess in in general, I've been just listening to a lot of like whale noise music, <laughs> and then. But I've also been really into, you know, I've always liked Kamasi Washington. Yeah, like that. The epic, I think, is a really cool record. And I didn't know much about Thundercat, um, the bass player who's got records out. So I've been listening to a lot of him mm. lately. And he's just a really out there, really genius guy. So I've been listening to, to, to him all day. And then uh, one of the guys in Fontaine just told me to revisit Joni Mitchell because he's on a big Joni Mitchell kick. So all day I was listening to Joni Mitchell. 
uh, uh, who I kind of missed growing up. So just you know, I'm all over all over the map that way. What about you? Um, same, just all over the place. Still kind of exploring that weird German stuff. <laughs> yeah, man, the German prog rock stuff's out there and really amazing. Yeah. yeah. So the Popol Vuh. And musicians there are in every country and in every era. Yeah. Getting back to some of the old uh, Delta Blues stuff, which never goes too far away. Yeah, but uh, I'm getting a too much music and not enough book talk comment. <laughs> okay, yeah, sorry. It's, it's from a friend of mine, so that's okay. Uh, well, anyway, sorry to keep you so long, um, but it's always a it's always a treat to get a chance to talk to you, Willie. And congratulations uh, on the new book. It's just a killer. Oh, thanks. And and Poison Pen is one of the great bookstores. So hopefully when everything COVID lifts up, people coming to Phoenix for whatever reason will come stop by and uh, check it out. Because it is like, I remember the, that time I, I did a reading there, I was just blown away at how amazing it was. Uh, it was uh, if, especially if you, if you like mystery or crime or noir, it's just, it's heaven. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, have the Delines ever played Arizona? No, man. You know, we really, we, we've only toured Europe. Uh, I don't think we we haven't done any U.S. tours. I, I think we're all we, we get these offers to play in Europe and they're kind of fun and everybody will get in the van. And I think uh, in the States, it's it's harder to get everybody in the van. And it's, it just seems more it brings back those old those old uh, memories of touring for years when no one liked you. Uh, uh, so it's hard. It's hard to get people in the van. So we'll see. I don't know if we'll ever tour the States, to be honest. Well, hope someday to see you guys out here. But, yeah, yeah, uh, man. Yeah. All right, Willie. Well, you have a great night. And thanks, everybody, for watching tonight. And uh, we still have a handful of signed copies left of the new book here. But I'm going to hit Willie up for some more. So uh, I'll put that link in the, uh, in the comments field. But um, thanks again, man. I'll talk to you soon. Hey, thank you. I, I really had a good time. It's good seeing your face and catching up. You too. Take All right, care. man. Good night.